Thank you, everyone. And we'll get started. So kia ora koutou. Thank you for joining us tonight um, for the panel event as part of our Developing Ethnic Leaders uh, initiative at Sport Waitakere. Before we get really get into the event tonight, I would like to open us up with a karakia. So you can join along with me um, with your mics muted so we make sure we've got it all sorted. Um, tu tawa mai runga, tu tawa mai raro, tu tawa mai waho, tu tawa mai roto. Uh, tu tawa mai roto, tu tawa mai waho. Kia taua te mori tu, kia taua te mori ora, kia tātou katoa. Tūturu whakamoa, kia tina, tina. Haumi e hui e tai ki. Tai ki. Ko Javid Ali tōku inua, kei Sport Waitakiri ahoa mahi ana, nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, just quickly in translation, um, I, sum, I summoned above, from above, I summoned from below, I summoned from within and the surrounding environment, the universal vitality and energy to infuse and enri enrich all present, unified, connected and blessed. Kia ora, my name is Javid Ali and I am the Community Sport and Rec team lead here at Sport Waitakere and once again I'd like to um, welcome everyone to what is phase two of the Developing Ethnic Leaders project that we are here doing at Sport Waitakere, but also the panel event. Um, first, we'll start with a really quick video to set the scene for the evening. And this video is from a piece of work that the collective RST, CLM and Active um, did with the Super Diversity Institute in 2019 regarding cultural intelligence. Video four is about diverse thinking. Diverse thinking is really important. You know, I talked about IQ and EQ being important, and then we introduced CQ, cultural intelligence. Well, I now need to introduce DT. Well, what is diverse thinking? It's seeing the same dots and joining them up in a different way. And diverse thinking is incredibly important in any organisation because unless you've got diverse thinkers in the room, then you're not going to bring all of the solutions to the table. In fact, you're not even going to see all of the risks. You're not going to see all of the issues. You're not going to have a 360 degree view of the solutions to the problems. You're going to have group think. You're going to be in an enclave. It becomes even more important in this fast paced society that we now live in, that we have diverse thinkers around the table, not just incrementalists, but people who are also transformational and disruptive. If we don't have the full range of people who can think diversely right across the spectrum, then we're going to miss out on seeing things, having insights, seeing risks, spotting problems, and most importantly, spotting solutions. Diverse thinking is like the Avengers. You only need one Hulk. If everybody in your organization and everybody in your senior management and everybody in your board says, yep, we all agree, then there's something wrong. <laughs> You need more diverse thinkers. So hopefully that starts to get us thinking a little bit more about the value of um, diverse thinking. And while I was while I was going through the report, of, um, Isman Tutu passed away, and I was looking through some of the work he did and some of the work he's advocated for over the years, and I think. You know, this, this quote here really um, is apt for tonight and we're not going and pulling, you know, putting numbers against um, boards and saying you need to have this many people. We need to know why they're not being on boards in the first place. So it's really to, to get this diverse thinking going and um, trying to get more diversity around those, those boards that we have. Um, so whilst I know we are all here to hear from our amazing panelists, what we will, um, from our amazing panelists, oops, sorry, here we go. Let's keep working here. Um, I'd like to quickly give you a little background around the Developing Ethnic Leaders Kaupapa that we are doing here at Sport Waitakere. So Developing Ethnic Leaders is funded by the Ministry of Ethnic Communities through the Ethnic Communities Development Fund. Um, the purpose of the project is to increase the representation of our ethnic communities and boards and committee roles in community sport organizations in West Auckland. After we explored the codes that we know were highly participated by our broader Asian communities. And when I, when I mention the word broader Asian communities throughout the night, I'm talking about our Indian, Chinese, Korean, Filipino, Pakistani, so the whole continent. And we're looking at those that make up those that are from the region. 
And we found that while Pākehā made up approximately 50% of the membership in sports clubs, they were also overrepresented in formal leadership roles, with almost 80% of board or committee members being Pākehā. So it was important to understand the barriers and the needs of our broader Asian community as it related to them to as it related to formal leadership roles. So my colleague Jason Lee and I, who's um, on the call as well, um, spoke to about 10 members of our broader Asian community to understand the barriers, their barriers and needs. Um, this resulted in an insights report and a link to the report will be put in the chat for you to have a read at a later date if you haven't done so already. Um, but what, whilst we acknowledge that it is a small group of people that we have spoken to, we believe that it's opened the door for us to have these greater conversations as time go on and really start to create a difference within, within our system and, and highlight the issues that are going on. So as you can see on the screen, there are some of the, some of the barriers that we've listed on, you know, some that we've listed here on the screen, but worryingly, worryingly Racism and discrimination were highlighted by as barriers. And it's important to recognize that whilst racism and discrimination does not always exist overtly, um, it can be systemic, systemic or institutional in, in nature. So what was also interesting to find was the perception of a regular group of people holding such roles, which seemed quite problematic if we think about it. Um, if we go back to what I said earlier around the, the number of um, Pākehā being represented on boards. Um, whilst we provided a number of recommendations, the most important for us is the last one and valuing diversity. Valuing diversity is so important. One of the great parts of diversity is diversity of thought as we heard, it, heard earlier on today. It brings the difference of opinion and thought to issues presented. And this could even be from a lens that you cannot see through yourself. Diversity allows for organizations to thrive, innovate and adapt. And as we know through COVID and the pandemic, that this is really important to survive. So I would like to now ask um, Lynette Adams, CEO of Sport Waitakere, to turn on her mic and share some words with us today. Ko Lynette Adams, toko ingoa, ko au te manahotu o hakinikina Waitakere. Nō reira, ki ora, tātou katoa. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending tonight's webinar. <clears throat> As you know, Auckland, Aotearoa, but particularly West Auckland, is an increasing diverse community with over 150 different ethnicities and nearly half of the population are identifying as Māori, Chinese, Indian or Samoan. At Sport Waitakere, our aim is to reduce the barriers, especially for our ethnically diverse communities, so that they do have more opportunities to engage, participate and lead in sport and physical activity. To that end, I wish to acknowledge the Sport Waitakere team and the work we are doing in the ethnic engagement space. We have a saying at work, to be as us. So we employ people from the ethnic communities to work with and support those communities so that they can have positive experiences being active. So the report fell out of our ethnic engagement work. And as Javid's just said, Jason and Javid co-wrote the report because we know that sport and recreation can provide a shortcut for migrant social integration. And this includes being physically active, entertainment, establishing social networks and language improvement. And yet we also knew that many sport providers were not being explicitly inclusive leaving many minority communities worried whether they will feel welcomed or not. So we've uncovered clear barriers to Asian migrants becoming leaders and influencers within their chosen sports codes. So despite their high participation and represent representation within the clubs, we found that racism is very much alive. And so we wanted to have an insights report that would bring some of this out into the open so that we can start having more direct conversations and look at ways that we might change this. In 2000, Nelson Mandela made that amazing quote, which you've probably all heard, but I will say it again. Sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth in a language they understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than government in breaking down racial barriers. 
So this says to me that we have a great opportunity to use sport and physical activity as the vehicle to break down racial barriers in our communities. But how do we really change the systems we're in? What leadership is required? Why should we do this? Who should do it? What's holding us back? And actually, where do we start? I wanna make us clear, this is not an inquisition. This is not a witch hunt. This is the start of a journey, an opportunity to be open, to be vulnerable, learn, and then make meaningful change. We believe that this could be the beginning of further conversations, a call to action, if you like. And later on tonight, we'll ask some questions to understand how we might collectively start. Many of you would have received the report via an email that I sent out. Honestly, I've been so overwhelmed by the response and it's been in a good way. This is clearly an issue that people across the motu are ready to start addressing. And I look forward to seeing where this takes us all. So I really want to thank Jason and Javid. I think, want to thank you for being courageous and starting this conversation in our organisation in West Auckland and now further afield. And I want to thank you who are here tonight that are willing and thinking about trying to make a change. I also want to thank the Ministry of Ethnic Communities for funding this piece of work. And I wish to acknowledge the esteemed panel in Nigeria, our moderator. And I'm very lo much looking forward to hearing from you all. Norera Tenakoto Katoa. Kia ora. Thank you, Lynette. That's um, some, some awesome words to, to show the Sport Waitakere journey along this piece of work. Um, I would like now to ask the Minister, um, Priyanka Radhakrishnan, to turn on her mic and to share some words with us. Um, good evening to you all. And can I just begin by acknowledging um, and thanking Sport Waitakere really for hosting us all here today virtually um, and for the invitation to say a few words uh, and also to be part of the panel discussion after this. Um, particularly can I can't thank you Javed, to you, your team, Lynette to you as the CEO. Um, thank you for the work that Sports Waitakere is doing in the ethnic diversity and inclusion space, because it's incredibly important that we all do um, this work across various sectors. Can I also particularly acknowledge uh, you, Javed, and Jason for co-authoring uh, this research uh, report, which I read with great enthusiasm uh, as well. Um, also acknowledging our moderator for the panel discussion to follow, um, Najira Khanum, and also my fellow um, panelists, Susan Chu, um, Rakesh Naidu, and Richard Leong. Great to see you all here as well. Can I also, as Lynette did, uh, just acknowledge everyone who's on this Zoom call today, because it's clear that you're here because you are also passionate about change in this space. So can I thank you for the work that you do in your spheres and sectors to this end as well. Now, um, Javid, as you mentioned, you know, some of the barriers that this, uh, the research that you've both undertaken, um, some of the barriers that you highlighted include things like, um, you know, cultural and language barriers, um, that included, for example, a culture shock or particularly first generation migrants not quite understanding specific terminology that might be used or the system um, and how it works and not feeling like they fit in. That, of course, links to the racism and broader discrimination that the, re the report highlights as well. It also touched on the fact that people often feel or are made to feel that there's a lack of space for them at leadership tables. So really important in terms of flipping these two opportunities to make sure that people who are in leadership positions now create that space um, as well. And, um, and of course, the broader conversation that we've, we're starting to have around recognizing the benefits or the value of diversity. And I think that lands differently in different sectors or the language in which it's used to convey, you know, the value of benefits differs. So you've highlighted some of the practical or tangible um, benefits of diversity, for example, you know, being able to respond to different needs, um, members seeing themselves reflected or represented at leadership levels. You know, often people say you can't see what, what you can't, you can't be what you can't see. And that's um, incredibly true. Um, but also, the fact that leadership spaces, whether it's boards or other groups that are diverse, 
um, result in better quality decision making. And so often, if it's a private sector board, you've got the language of uh, a better bottom line as a result um, as well. And of course, a number of recommendations and opportunities that the report has identified. A lot of that aligns with what the government is wanting to achieve as well in this space. Lots of similarities and parallels um, in terms of being committed to highlighting the value that diversity brings to our communities and really taking steps to make spaces more inclusive so that everyone can feel safe, valued, that they belong and that they're able to participate fully um, across society. The new Ministry for Ethnic Communities has four strategic priorities that were set by the communities um, it serves. And in fact, one of it is to, um, you know, promote the value of diversity so that New Zealanders more broadly can understand those benefits and also to uh, take steps to include ethnic communities in wider society as well. Um, as I said previously, research has shown us time and again that better quality decisions are made when spaces are more diverse. Um, we're having those conversations in terms of public sector boards, and I thought I'll touch on just two um, areas that are priorities for me um, specifically. One of that is to improve diversity on public sector boards and committees. Our latest stock take, in fact, we uh, measured ethnicity on public sector boards for the first time in 2019. And then again in 2020, we saw about a one percentage point increase to 4.8%. This is about 400 public sector boards and committees, about 800 appointments. And given that our communities uh, make up close to 20% of New Zealand's population, although there's a trend upwards, 4.8% is just not good enough. So we've got a deliberate program of work to change that. Um, and the Ministry for Ethnic Communities is working with, for example, the Ministry for Pacific Peoples and the Ministry for Women um, to identify areas where they can work together. The Ministry also has a nomination service that aims um, at changing the face of decision making in New Zealand by connecting suitable candidates from ethnic communities to appointing agencies. The decision on appointments, of course, are made by those other ministries agencies, but we're building a pipeline of people that we can support through to those appointments. So just a bit of a plug to everyone on here. If you're interested in being part of that, do check out the ministry's website. It's a bit more information there. Um, and also you can sign up to the nominations database um, through there. This is work that is intended to then feed into the wider cross-government initiatives that's led by the Public Service Commission on making our public service more broadly, much more diverse and inclusive so that um, government services are more um, equitable as well. And finally, I'm launching an action plan at the end of this week that is focused on improving employment outcomes for former refugees, new migrants and ethnic communities more broadly. Some of those actions um, that are part of that plan will also go some way in supporting people, employers and leaders to recognize the value of diversity and to build an evidence base and tools that will support inclusion as well. So I'll leave it at that, um, but can I just once again acknowledge all the organizations and individuals who we hear supporting this kaupapa and particularly um, thanks to Sport Waitakere as well. So thanks again for having me. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for all those words and, and the appreciation as well. Um, for, for the main event tonight, I would like to firstly introduce um, Najera, who will be moderating our panel and facilitating our panel tonight. Um, Najera is a member of Auckland Council's Ethnic Peoples Advisory Board, a trustee of the Auckland, Refuge, Auckland Refugee Family Trust. Her previous experience includes policy, relationship management and various cross-sector leadership roles in New Zealand and internationally. Um, she's currently a systems change activator at Belong Aotearoa, driving transformational change to improve inclusion, belonging and well-being for refugee background and migrant communities. So for our main event tonight, I'd like to invite um, Najira and the panelists to turn on their microphones and um, have this great conversation that we're looking all looking very, very much forward to. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that bio of me. How strange it is to hear it. But Tainakoto, Katoa, Tainakoto, Ite Kopapa, Otera, 
tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora ko Najira Khanum Aho, and I'm really excited to be your moderator this evening um, for this panel discussion on an important topic, so developing ethnic leaders. Um, and a big thank you to you for joining us this evening. We have an absolute stellar lineup of guest speakers this evening who I'll introduce um, shortly. And they will each talk about their experience in governance roles across many settings. And they're going to share their ups and downs in governance roles, along with providing those important insights and tips for our aspiring leaders who want to get into those um, governance roles. And just some housekeeping. So at the end of this discussion, there'll be a, a, a Q&A session. So I do encourage you to ask questions through the chat function here on Zoom. And the wonderful Sport Watakri team will be moderating these behind the scenes. And now to our panelists. Honorable Priyanka Radhikrishnan is the Minister for the Community and Voluntary Sector, a Minister for Diversity, Inclusion and Ethnic Communities, Minister for Youth, an Associate Minister for Social Development and Employment, and MP for Mongakiki. She is the first person of Indian origin to become a minister in New Zealand and was appointed in November 2020. Thank you for joining us, Minister. Rakesh Naidu has worked in partnership with diverse communities globally for over 30 years. He holds multiple governance roles, including Director of Sport New Zealand, New Zealand Football Executive Committee Director, New Zealand Football Foundation Trustee, and Wellington Phoenix Football for All Development Trustee. He has worked for New Zealand Police for 21 years, and in 2012, he became the first ethnic person ever to be appointed as a commissioned officer um, in police. Thank you for joining us tonight, Rakesh. Richard Leung has served Chinese community organizations for over 25 years and is passionate about stronger, positive, strategic governance in community sport. He is the chair of the Auckland branch of the New Zealand Chinese Association and the immediate past national president of the New Zealand Chinese Associations. He holds multiple governance roles currently, including a member of Ka Puiya, Ministerial Advisory Group on the Government Response to the Royal Commission of Inquiry on the terrorist attack, attack, attack on Christchurch mosques, and is a member of the Police Commissioner's Ethnic Focus Forum. Thank you for joining us, Richard. And last but certainly not least, Suzanne Drew, who's an elected member of the FO Local Board, a legal professional with extensive knowledge and understanding of protocols and issues of new migrant and refugee communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. She has nearly 20 years of governance experience, and she brings a strong understanding and sound knowledge of New Zealand central and local government policies, structures, decision making and operating procedures to the boards which she currently serves, community and corporate. Thank you, Susan, for joining us. Um, so to kickstart our discussion, I'm going to go straight into our question. Um, and the first one is to each of our um, wonderful panel members here today. So what or who has inspired you to get into a formal um, leadership role in your respective sectors? And can you please just summarize for us what your experiences have been like so far? Um, and I'd like to go to Rakesh first, please. Well, kia ora and thank you, Najira, for your kind introduction. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yep. Excellent. Uh, just want to acknowledge everyone as well as all the participants. Uh, there was a few, um, you could say, panel things that were on this evening. And selecting this one, thank you for so, so much for doing so. Um, and just a shout out to a couple of people in the sector that I know, Alvin, Paula, Hussein, uh, great to have you on. Uh, as well, and to uh, I'm sure you'll have some insights also to provide. Um, really, what got me into uh, sport governance um, was somebody named Jamie Mull. Uh, Jamie Mull uh, used to work at uh, New Zealand Football, and I've known Jamie for a whole lot of years in just uh, community work. And Jamie said, "Hey, there's a role that's coming up on uh, football. Do you reckon uh, you'd be interested?" and uh, said, oh, well, Jamie, uh, what does it involve? He said, ah, nothing too, too uh, significant. Just put a, just let me your CV and we'll see how it goes. Uh, and next thing I knew I was in a room uh, giving a, uh, having to uh, deliver a presentation on why I'd like to be on the executive committee of New Zealand football. And being, uh, I think at that time there was one room, probably about 
close to about 100 people. And I think there was about two people of ethnicity in the room, <laughs> me and one other person. Um, and uh, it was uh, qu quite a revelation for me, really. And um, But he was the one that got me into sports governance, and I'm, I'm always very grateful uh, to Jamie. Uh, the, you know, how has been my um, experiences so far? Uh, there's a saying in, uh, an Indian saying, kata mita, a bitter sweet and salty, but a bitter <laughs> and uh, enjoyable. So, um, you know, when I first went into my first governance role, it was, um, there was, uh, within a few months, there was a national independent review of bullying and harassment and uh, financial issues, a whole, whole lot of other challenges that really came to the fore. And uh, it was quite interesting being in that environment to deal with those challenges immediately off, off the bat. And, um, and then you get the flip side of that when we, uh, you know, just four years later, we're hosting, uh, co-hosting the largest sporting women's event uh, globally, which is the FIFA Women's World Cup that's coming to our shores next year uh, just shows the, I guess, the expanse and the breadth and the highs and lows that you can have. But that's uh, just a little bit to get us going. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rakesh. Talking about the katamita, the seat and the sour, I think that's um, some words for us to remember then. I'm going to swiftly move on to Susan, please, if you could turn your mic on and share with us your thoughts. Uh, thank you. Um, firstly, thanks for this opportunity and thanks to um, Sports Wat Hakri for organizing this uh, wonderful um, governance training program. And um, um, it's, it's wonderful to have our panel members here to share our um, insights. Um, I, um, I was a migrant um, in 2000, came to New Zealand, um, and I was engaged with uh, community services work as volunteer. Um, I can't um, remember exactly who has encouraged me to get into um, community leadership, but I, I certainly remember my work started with um, some um, community organizations. Instead of um, um, being on the board, I started with volunteer, volunteering work to help um, particularly the Chinese communities uh, with their governance work. Um, sometimes help with their funding application and give them uh, advice of how to um, prepare and conduct um, effective board meetings. Um, and uh, especially after I um, took um, legal um, studies and to provide some um, advice to them how to um, conduct their affairs in terms of um, uh, the governance role um, and um, according to their um, uh, trusts or, or uh, constitutions and etc. Uh, I've been on uh, quite a few boards, um, uh, for example, started at, at, on the Watakri Ethnic Board and Auckland Council Ethnic um, People's Panel uh, and Chinese uh, um, organizations um, like a Chinese uh, Women's Association and etc. and then being elected members on the full local board Auckland Council since 2003. Um, I think um, the inspirations why I'm getting into this is, is about service, how to serve our community and, and also being a strong voice. Um, like we all know, Auckland is very diverse. Uh, new migrants particularly sometimes uh, lack of that strong voice and, and uh, being part of, of that decision-making um, process. Um, so um, I've been encouraged to uh, get into uh, this space and, and um, to representing um, the, the community's voice and, and also make a, a positive um, contribution towards to the decision-making process. Um, I'm involved in the um, uh, Bamoral Badminton Club as well as the uh, Auckland Bam um, the board of Auckland and Badminton ABA. Um, certainly, there were some uh, highs and dramas um, uh, from time to time. Um, yeah, possibly I will share this experience uh, later on um, in terms of my um, <laughs> my experience and, and, and tips and advice um, uh, coming up in the later questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, the highs and dramas, hey, of governance. 
But it's so inspiring to hear you talk about service, amplifying voices and, and positively contributing to decision making. Thank you so much for that. Um, and now over to you, Richard. Thanks, Nadira. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I suppose my journey um, started in, in sports in terms of um, I lived in, I grew up in Wellington and in Wellington, we had a Chinese uh, sports club called Dragon and it was a basketball club and I played basketball. Um, on that committee, on, the, on that club committee, they were always um, looking for, for, for the younger generation to come onto the, onto the committee and to contribute. So that was my first sort of taste, um, probably when I was in my early 20s, um, getting onto a, a sports uh, committee. Um, I think the, the real reason was that the, the older, older ones didn't want to um, do all the work, so they got us young guys to come on. Um, and then that led me to um, the New Zealand Chinese Association, um, they, ha they held, um, or they hold, a sports tournament every Easter. Uh, and it's been going for over 70 years, continue, uh, pretty much continuously, apart from uh, the COVID, COVID um, disruptions. And um, the, the association is over um, 80 years old, um, formed in 1935. And that history of that, of, of that community um, really sort of uh, ramped up my, um, and inspired me and encouraged me to, to join the, the Auckland branch committee because um, I wanted to continue the, the legacy that, that the, our past com committee members had um, done in terms of all the things I've done for our community and to make sure that our, our association carried on into the future for, the, for my kids and for my hopefully grandchildren. Um, and it, that's pretty much why I, I went into, uh, into the community governance. And then from there, um, I was elected as national president and that and that gave me opportunities to um, work with um, government organizations and um, to be invited onto governance um, and into advisory um, boards to voice, be a voice for our community. So that's sort of um, how I, my journey has been so far. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. I think it's quite, poignant um the commitment to community and legacy and i think that's coming through really strongly and um what's being shared by our panelists and of course um the organizations here with um sport by tackle leading this research but thank you for that richard um and now i'd like to pass to our minister thanks Nigeria. um two things so firstly, soon after I moved to New Zealand and started working for an NGO, part of my role was lobbying successive governments for change. And through that experience, it made me really see how accessible um, our democracy is in New Zealand and the fact that people could actually affect systemic change. So that was one. Um, the second, to cut a very long story short, is that I was doing my master's um, at Vic and a former cabinet minister happened to be doing one of my papers with me. Uh, we became good friends and he suggested at the end of that that I'd been working in the NGO sector for so long, knocking on the doors for change, that why didn't I think of trying to be part of the, you know, part of that change and at the table, um, because I had never thought about standing for parliament before that. And that's really what made me think, oh, actually that appeals. So yeah, and then seeing, you know, at the time when I came, Helen Clark was prime minister and seeing things change um, through the work that she was doing and all of that was, um, was inspiring and made me feel that change was possible. Thank you, Minister. So I definitely agree. We do have an accessible democracy, so let's all get involved. I love that piece around, you know, people, we can all affect change, including systems change. And, you know, that's a big driver for the work that I personally do in my um, day job. Um, so thank you all for those um, wonderful thoughts. So just 
to dig a little bit deeper into your personal experiences and and as per sport Watakri's report it is well known that those who have a representative voice um, at the decision making table they are likely to reap the full benefits of the organization and the report yes it did identify seven key barriers for participating in formal leadership roles in community sport as well as some recommendations for change um, I was thinking with some of some of our panelists have touched on this, but just from your perspective, what do you think are the key barriers to participation in governance role, for example, in community sport for ethnic people? For example, some of the hurdles you might have had to um, personally jump through. Um, um, for this question, I'd, I'd like to go to Richard first, please. Yeah, I think some of, some of the, I suppose, barriers, um, is, I suppose confidence to join into to a organization um, and not really understanding how the, um, the organization is maybe governed or um, what what the actual committee does etc especially if you're a new migrant um, and you're not you don't understand what how things happen in the New Zealand context um, some examples or hurdles that I've had to sort of jump through um, some of the uh, some of the older, I suppose, um, members of of the committees um, sometimes are reluctant to um, accept change um, or even um, listen to your ideas. Um, other things is um, sometimes you get a um, have an imposter um, syndrome. But once you get over that and um, you recognize the value that you bring with your authentic self to the table, you know, you can relax and contribute. So, yeah, those are some of the things that I've found. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for sharing, sharing those points with us. Um, Susan, what are your feelings around this? Any, any uh, hurdles that you've had to jump through um, to get into your many governance roles? You are mute, Susan. Sorry, <laughs> the technology issues. Yeah, um, uh, certainly Richard has uh, shared some barriers which I personally share the same as well. Um, at the beginning, there's um, lack of confidence, um, lack of um, understanding about um, the protocols and the process, how the, um, for how the boards run. Um, and um, as a new migrant, sometimes we bit of shy um, to raise our voice and um, be, uh, particularly uh, when the others around the board uh, around the table um, are different from different perspectives. Um, I think um, uh, for me um, it's difficult even now um, I'm quite experienced um, uh, in the governance roles and, and for example in, in the local board um, uh, I still feel lonely um, because, you know, politics is sometimes it's just about um, different interests and, and you negotiate and, and, uh, and share and, and sometimes debate, um, advocate for a certain interest of a group of people. Um, even with um, our four local board, we are very diverse. We work really well um, around the table with other members. But when it comes to the ethnic uh, issues, I still feel I'm the only voice. Um, the the others may um, wanted to support, but not necessarily have enough knowledge and experience in terms of um, how ethnic people's needs and and programs how to address those uh, inequities in, in and etc. So. Um, that, that's my personal experience. I really, so that's why I really like to encourage more ethnic people to be um, uh, involved in the governance roles and, and uh, to be uh, around the decision making power, um, table because we do need more voices um, to be able to advocate for uh, different um, interests, um, particularly for our ethnic and refugee communities. Thank you so much, Susan. So that's a great call to action for all of us tonight, um, be at the decision-making table. And I wondered if 
just an opportunity for the, the minister or Rakesh to jump in or share any reflections that haven't been shared already around this question, feel free to, otherwise we can move on to the next question. Well, um, yeah, I'm happy to share something, if that's all right, minister. Uh, yeah, so, you know, one of the things is um, from our new communities, right? When we come to New Zealand, if somebody were to say, tell your parents or oh, I want to play football, say, well, here's the ball, go and kick it on outside. You know, you want to play cricket? Uh, here's a bat, go and play cricket. And education and everything else takes precedent over, uh, you could say, recreation. And as kids grow up, they, the knowledge of the ecosystem of New Zealand and sport uh, is very limited. And I think that the more we try to educate and inform people about the opportunities that exist, that sitting in the sporting environment is massive. I think people look for board opportunities in schools. They look for board opportunities in the public service. Uh, but they, <laughs> there's a club in every single neighborhood uh, of some form, either badminton, cricket, rugby, tennis, um, football, basketball. And most of these places that you will go to uh, are, are challenged. Some are really good, some are big, some are smaller, but they offer such a hub for our engagement. If you knock on the door and you try to uh, look at how that club is run, and that could be your first opportunity to actually just start in that space and, and that is massive. So I just think that the opportunity to educate our communities about the ecosystem of sport and the hundreds of clubs that are sitting out there and what can be achieved if you get involved with them and the networking that exists with, you know, job finding, just shoulder tapping. That's how New Zealand's network works uh, in part of, it's such a small country, people getting to know one another. You know, the, the other thing is, um, you know, it's touched upon the imposter system and, and governance and everything else. It's really challenging heading into a room where you're sitting as the sole voice or the sole person of ethnicity or, or even if a different thinking, doesn't matter, gender, ethnicity, whatever it may be. And um, it's really uh, quite intimidating when you're sitting with Olympians, maybe former players, or people that are really wealthy. I remember going to events and I mean, they're having a fundraiser on a boat, you know, or you, or you go overseas and you're like under the Eiffel Tower and, you, and you're in some governance meeting. They're like, what the hell am I doing here? And then you go to like South Auckland and you go into a community, um, uh, a sort of a community uh, event and you in a very humble club and you get to really question what's the purpose of you being there and what you're really trying to achieve. And it's really easy to get caught up in sort of the, um, I guess, you know, the perks that comes with things or seeking some things higher. So I guess that's something in the journey of where you're going to as a person and what you want to achieve really comes to the fore. And a lot of the work that we do in governance is a from a volunteer basis. So I really take my, my hat off to people that when they look at these roles, it really is, is centered in what you're gonna do for your community. So those are just, I think it's a lot of personal challenges and the stuff talked about in the report, you know, definitely the racism, discrimination, access, all of those things are, are live things. Um, but you gotta take a deep breath and decide, you know, how am I gonna, uh, well, yeah, what am I gonna look to achieve and what are the short term, um, things I, I can focus on, but what, the, what is the biggest thing is the longer term outcomes I'm gonna actually gonna, gonna see. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Rakesh. Um, yes, talk, talk about everything you've said. Um, the barriers are alive um, and there's so much more work to be done to, to do better, be better. Um, I really appreciate you sharing those thoughts with us just then. And actually this, then leads into a really great um, segue for the next question that I'd like to pose to our panel this evening. And that's from your perspective, and we have touched on some of this, what are the changes and opportunities that you think will make the big, biggest difference um, in terms of governance and um, ethnic people being at the table? And I'd like to go to our minister first for this question. 
Um, I think it's being deliberate about the change that we want to see and the sectors that we want to see it in. Um, and then, because I think, and I think this flows from what everyone was saying in the previous, um, in response to the previous question you asked, Nigeria. I think it's, we can group those barriers in ones that require systemic change and ones that we that require change on an individual level. You know, some, some of those things around imposter syndrome or feeling that you're not good enough um, are sometimes underlying with they're there, we all feel them in various spaces. So there are things that we can do, whether that's governance training or, you know, changes that we make that target at an individual level. And then there's stuff that we can all do at a systemic level to make changes like this across the sports sector, across the public sector boards um, space, private sector boards. So I think we need to be deliberate about the spaces in which we can affect change um, and about the way in which we're going to do that. Thank you, Minister. I mean, come on, this is so much, so much richness being shared tonight. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of this that we're very closely connected to. So um, please, you know, if you have got any burn questions at the moment that you'd like to ask our uh, panel tonight, um, put your questions in, in, in the chat box. Um, and now I'd like to ask the same question to um, Rakesh, we'll go to Rakesh with this one. Just around some of the pieces around opportunities. Uh, yeah, I think that the, well, firstly around the biggest, well, one is the changes that can be made. And I think like uh, example with Sports New Zealand asked all NSOs that you're gonna have 40% uh, gender equity on, on your boards by a particular date. And, um, you know, that uh, has, has been achieved. And that has uh, really put an impetus for, for change to take place. So I think uh, where you are looking at levers like that, that can be pulled in the charity sector, other sector that where you are getting government funding or you are getting um, some, uh, you're functioning under some legislative criteria that there is opportunity for equity to be put in place and for for that to reflect New Zealand society's thinking and, and, and real diversity. And I think that's a healthy thing. And that's, that's um, you know, first up the best opportunity that we have. You know, for me, when I look at the opportunities in governance and the opportunities that can be achieved in, in a sports context, I just, uh, you know, from social cohesion to settlement, to employment, to, uh, you know, I'm a sole person on the fact that I think sport can, can accomplish everything for people because it's just so powerful when you're sitting in a stadium full of people and you just feel the atmosphere and what's taking place. I feel that when you keep, you get youth involved in activities at a young age connected to the local clubs, it really changes the entire lifestyle where you can go from somebody who has really have, have achieved very uh, come from any background and end up as a gold medalist or end up on the, on the largest stage, or you can simply keep fit and participate in your local club and build your sense of community. Um, so access into the sporting environment and knowledge of that sporting environment and what can be achieved for me is the biggest opportunity from mental health to uh, dealing with uh, gangs to dealing with just your well-being. Uh, your social cohesion and connection and feeling of inclusion, just the ability to walk into a place and to meet somebody you never thought that you'd meet in a thousand years or and you all of a sudden uh, you, you're with them. And I think that's the beauty of New Zealand, that we have two degrees of separation. And that is so, um, you, you can go into West Auckland and meet an, an all, all black. <laughs> you, can, you can meet a, a current a member of the Olympic team. And that's just wonderful. You can go to uh, Richard's uh, Breakers. Uh, he's got his uh, hoop quarters and you can hang out at the Breakers. And that's, you know, that's just fascinating for me. So there's, those are the opportunities. Thank you so much, Rakesh. So, you know, we've got plenty of opportunities just discussed then, system, societal and individual. Um, and a passion for sport quite clearly. <laughs> and I just want to give the opportunity to uh, Richard. And um, Susan, if, you, if you'd like to add any thoughts that haven't been covered in the reflections, um, please feel free to. 
or we can move on. <clears throat> I, I would like to share um, just on the personal level, I think. Um, um, firstly, as um, mentoring, uh, I think it's important to uh, have a mentor, um, particularly in a, a specific board you are interested in, uh, in the field you are interested in, find a mentor and, and to try to get to understand what, what they do um, how they do it um, on, on the board level. Uh, and um, governance training is very, very important. I think uh, it's very encouraging to see Sports Watakri is doing this training program to, to help people to understand the roles and responsibilities of uh, different um, um, uh, roles in the, in the governance um, board. Um, for example, chair's role and um, secretary, treasurer, what do they do, what the requirements are in, uh, in accordance with the constitution and law um, requirements. Um, all those are uh, building the experience and understanding about the role of governance. Um, yeah, that I think is quite important. Um, I would like to see more people put their hand up um, to be the mentors who are um, experienced in this area. Thank you, Susan. I think mentoring has come through strongly in um, Sport Watakri's research report too, so it's great to reiterate that. And Richard, you turned on your mic. You turned yep. on your mic. Go for yeah. it. Yeah, I'll, yeah I endorse all the um, things that have been said already. But the other thing I'd like to say is that um, it's giving opportunity, you know, in an individual um, sense, is giving opportunities um, to those that want to learn about governance. Um, for example, um, the New Zealand Chinese Association, um, we run several um, events like our Easter sports tournament, which is run every year. Um, we have a leadership development conference for young professionals and a youth leadership camp for high school students. And what we do is we give our younger generation opportunities to, to run those events. So from, so they get governance um, experience, they have, to, they have to make applications to get funding, they have to do the budgeting, they have to set the programs. And then we have them have um, senior members on our executive be mentors on those on those committees. So having those um, opportunities for, the, for those uh, up and coming leaders who want to get into governance is really important. And that's something maybe organizations need to look at, little projects in a, in a sports club um, that they can throw you know, the way of, of these young leaders. Thank you, Richard. I think that's a great point about bringing in younger people on this journey for transformative change and building them so they're in there in those governance and leaderships in the future. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I feel inspired by what's been shared. And now for our um, audience that have joined today, uh, I would just want to ask our panelists, can you just share some advice or some top tips for aspiring and emerging ethnic leaders who would like to get into um, the governance roles that you may be in? And I'd like to go to um, Susan first, please. Um, from me perspective, um, as uh, I think uh, um, most of the governance roles are voluntary roles. So don't be afraid. Um, try to get into it because people would like to have more um, energy to share the workload with. So it's, it's not a bigger barrier. Just put your hand up, you know, um, and uh, get into the roles and, and learn from what you do. And there are plenty of people who would like to welcome you and, and to, um, would like to mentor in you. Um, that's a good first step forward. Um, secondly, um, I would like to encourage more younger people to get into governance role because what you do in the community, in the voluntary basis, uh, and you will learn the leadership which can uh, use it for your, um, your own career development as well. Um, those trainings free. Um, I see a lot of younger people um, coming up um, in their professional jobs um, and, and um, getting more and more um, exposure and get promoted because of their um, leadership experience in their voluntary work. Um, so um, yeah, um, that, that 
that's two of things I would like to encourage um, the young people to, to get into the governance role. Um, tips um, and advice is um, don't be afraid, um, speak up um, uh, for what you believe in uh, and be constructive. Um, there are some uh, uh, people who have been there for a very, very long time and they, they don't like to see changes, but you actually bring in the change um, the different um, way of thinking. So um, once you put your, um, your thoughts forward, uh, the, um, uh, more people will um, start to pay attention to it and, and you will be well received. Um, just be brief and be constructive. Thank you so much, Susan. I think your words there, be brave, um, speak up, deeply resonated with, with me and I'm sure many others too. Um, and just to give the opportunity for the minister to speak to this point as well, please. Um, thanks, Nazira. I'd say firstly, you know, if you're looking at um, different types of boards require different skill sets. So it would be, you know, find out based on the boards that you're interested in joining, what are the skill sets that they're looking for? Build those skills if you don't have those specific skills or broaden your toolkit in a sense, um, you know, do the mahi, get the treats kind of thing. Uh, but also talk to people who are on boards, find a mentor. I think there was a little bit on the chat um, screen just now on the importance of mentorship. And that's come through a number of my fellow panelists as well. Um, so, so build that. So that would be one part of what I'd say. The second part of it is often people say to me that there's you know, a societal expectation almost of what leadership or good leadership should look like. Um, often people feel that they need to fit a mold in order to get there, but that's exactly what we're trying to get away from, right? So don't let societal expectations of leadership necessarily define you. Um, forge your own leadership style based on the values that define you. Thank you for that, Minister. I just wanted to dig a little bit, bit deeper on that one, if that's okay. Um, you know, we often say, or I've heard, you know, there may be opportunities for you to get onto boards and um, people have, you know, I've heard anecdotally, people have then gone on from ethnic communities to try to go for these positions. But sometimes there's been um, some pushback or rejection based on you don't have enough governance experience. So, so what would your advice be around that? <clears throat> Yeah, there are level, different levels of governance experience that different boards require, and that is a fact. So if you don't have any and you're going for a board position that requires a high level of governance experience or um, particular financial skills and so on, then you probably need to build your toolkit to get to that point. And so there are various stepping stones. I mean, Susan mentioned, for example, community boards that people can get onto. That's valuable governance experience. You also then need to look at what transferable skills you might have. You may not have the level of formal governance experience that's required, but you might have transferable skills in the particular skill sets that those boards are looking for. So I'd say first, build your toolkit and build your experience um, because that always helps. It's never going to hurt your governance journey. But equally, look at how you define, and boards should do this too, look at how you define what experience is needed and what transferable skills people might have. So think outside the box a little, little bit, and I think that goes both ways. Thank you, Minister. That's well answered. Um, and now to Richard and Rakesh, please, just some of your, some of your top tips, advice around how, um, that you would give to emerging um, and aspiring leaders that want to get into these governance roles in the future. Yeah, I suppose most of the um, governance roles that, that, that are out there are, like um, Ricky said at the start, are in the sports um, sector in terms of there's clubs in every little town all around New Zealand. Um, and they're always looking for people to volunteer, come on a committee, because everyone is time poor these days. Um, and clubs, you know, a lot of clubs are short of people or volunteers. So there is those, there are opportunities there. Um, and you've got to put in the hard yards. You know, in the, in the sports sector, in the ethnic community sector, it's all voluntary. Um, very few sort of paid positions. Or, um, but once, once you're on those boards, it is a mix of governance and the doing. 
um, I've found. Um, so it's not just um, doing the governance work of looking after the, the um, organisation, but it's also doing those hard yards, organising events, organising teams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's not the same as a, as a corporate model, a corporate board. Um, but yeah, I suppose the, the biggest tip is that it is hard work and you, you've got to um, persevere and um, not be afraid of doing that hard work. Thanks, Richard. Yes, we need to we need to put in the hard yard hey, to get to get to where we want, as well as um, addressing some of those more um, systematic barriers that we've discussed earlier. Um, Rakesh, over to you. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I think just from a practical perspective, is that to to really think quite clearly. Um, what area you want to go into. And I say it in the context that right now we are sitting in quite a unique position in New Zealand in the sense that the value of uh, the conversation about diversity, the value of diversity, uh, our representation within parliament, our uh, the inquiries that have been done that are quite visible, like the Royal Commission of Inquiry, is really highlighted to key decision makers right across government, the importance of diversity, uh, the importance of uh, communities having better conversations and getting to know one another. So uh, I guess the strategic mindset and government uh, as well as societal uh, framework is really lending itself to uh, to the systems and processes that are more open than they have previously been. And the, while there is, there does exist challenges, it's the environment, should I say, is more conducive now to accepting somebody coming in, for example, coming to what sport Waitakere, knocking on the door and saying, you know what, I'd like an entry level governance uh, experience in uh, one of a local club. Can you look in your network of clubs around West Auckland, anything that's coming up that I could go and volunteer in or participate in. And I'm sure you'd get a very receptive uh, entry into that space. If you were to uh, think about a sport or code or, or even anything outside of that, and you were to say, you know, I'd like to be on this board, you know that you could put your CV into the Ministry for Ethnic Communities and you could go on to the list, you can follow up um, and then you can check with them. So. Uh, it is really a little bit of work yourself to target an area that you would like to see yourself uh, contributing to, and, this, and then taking the initiative in some sense to put yourself out there in order to let people know. And from there, uh, uh, I'm a firm believer that you let the universe know where you want to go, and then uh, <laughs> you know you you um, you'd be surprised what comes back. And rejection, I mean, we've been dealing with rejection uh, and for many people on, on this and that works in governance, you know, uh, very rarely do you get things the first time you try for it. And sometimes you're gonna just try again and again and again and again. And, and sport is the perfect example of that. You know, uh, we, we support teams that uh, go out and lose every week. And, uh, but we go out and we support them not because they're a winning team, but because our hearts with that team. And uh, many of you are on the call right now, you'll be long suffering football uh, supporters or rugby support or what, whatever it may be, basketball. And um, you know the challenge that is there to achieve success. And uh, so just uh, don't get disheartened, but all, all I'd say is that the environment right now is more conducive than ever for us to appreciate uh, the value of different thinking and diversity. Thank you so much, Rakesh. Yes, we need to focus on valuing diversity and the diversity of thought that ethnic communities can bring to those um, governance roles. I think there's been a whole lot of rich insights of volunteering, mentoring, speaking to others. You don't have to fit into a mold to be in these governance roles. Build your toolkit. Um, and remember that the face of diversity is changing. Within that, there is opportunity. Um, as well as you know, trying to go back to that point around addressing some of those um, systemic barriers and creating inclusive environments for communities to feel comfortable in. Um, 
And I'm just looking at the time, we're doing really well. We have four minutes for this next question. So that's a minute each. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you around, um, what's your vision for a better future in governance, in creating more inclusive board environments? Um, and I'm going to go to the minister for this question first. Um, my vision for this space is, is the same as my vision for us as a society. And that's for, for one where everyone feels, uh, you know, where they can feel safe and valued. They're bringing skills to the table and able to belong, whether that's in this, whatever space they're in, um, and able to participate um, fully. And I think I'm just, just looking at the, um, some of the points being made in the chat screen um, as we've been talking as well. Um, I'd really like for us to, to, this is going to be a little bit controversial, but I'd like for people not to get offended quite as, as easily as they do. I think that's really important. That goes to the point that Alvin's made in the chat as well, that we're not always going to get it right. I think, you know, if you are trying to make your organization as inclusive as possible, there's often hesitance from people because they don't want to offend people. They don't want to be culturally insensitive and they're not too sure what to do to avoid that. And so sometimes it goes into the too hard basket. It shouldn't. I think people should be bolder about having those conversations, but equally people shouldn't be as offended as sometimes they get because we're never all gonna get it right. And part of the value of diversity is disagreement. It is that feeling of being in that space of discomfort where you're trying to understand someone else, but you're not othering them because it's too difficult. We need to have those conversations and it's a two-way street. That's what I'd like to see us do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Susan, what are your, what's your vision? Um, I would like to suggest the two levels of um, uh, better improvement. Um, firstly, um, the every single board has a uh, voice um, from different um, um, age, um, ethnicity, agenda, different interests. So all voices around the decision-making table. Um, secondly, I would like to see um, people who ever has that desire and aspiration to be on the board um, has that opportunity to be around um, uh, the decision table as well. And um, there are no, no more barriers as we have discussed early on. Um, and people can be freely uh, to take a part in the governance role uh, as what they would like to be in. So all voices around the table, Tomataka. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, over to Richard. Yeah, mine's pretty short. Um, pretty much the boards or um, committees are, 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 are diverse and reflect the community that they are serving. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty short and sweet in terms of... Uh, a great vision. Thank you, Richard. Great vision. And Rakesh? Well, um, I guess I'll look at it from a, from a, from a perspective of, you know, life's too short. <laughs> and for me, you know, what, um, you know, since we started quoting uh, Tutu and Mandela, it's really, you know, what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived, but it's the difference that we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life that we have led, really. And we really got to uh, um, back ourselves that we are able to enter into these, um, into any challenge that we may have with these, uh, with the expectation that we're going to make some contribution, however small or however great. And that contribution will be able to make some difference, um, to the, not only to ourselves, but to New Zealand society. I think that, um, you know, some of the, uh, when we look at visions of what we want to achieve, we've got to look at a vision that is bigger than us and greater than us. And it's not just that I'm going to go onto this board and I'm going to get this, this, and this done. It's about putting in a, a little brick or a little foundation that you can actually contribute to other things coming in. And you may not even live to see it, or you may, or you may see it in, in a short time. So sh that change can come immediately, or that change can take a long time. But I think for me, that future is, mm -hmm. is the, the, the ability just to look at something that can be greater than yourself and, and how that can be achieved is by making some little contribution. 
Thank you so much, Rakesh. I think we've had some definitely achievable visions there set for set for Aotearoa and New Zealand. Um, and we are definitely looking at that long lasting positive change for um, the whole of society. Um, and now we're, I just thought we're doing great with time. So we have about 15, 20 minutes and, and I know um, Sport Watakri team have uh, just sent through some questions from um, our guests this evening. So I'm going to call people and just ask them to turn on their video and their mic um, and to ask the question directly. And the first one up is, okay, so Rakana from Belong Aotearoa, if I could invite you to um, ask your question, please. Oh, Kira, thank you. Um, really rich discussions and I'm just following up on um, my chat really. Um, and it was, you know, pointed out to me that the majority of us on this call are from ethnic communities or representing ethnic organizations. And it really got me thinking about, and it connects to some of the systems change work that we're trying to do at Belong. And um, really thinking about um, what the panel members uh, think is the best way to look for those levers of change, because it's almost like we're kind of speaking to the converted. So how do we go beyond and get that soft middle um, that they talk about when you're trying to make those changes? And um, if you could just um, indulge me for a second, there's a story I tell, and it's not my story, it's someone else's story, but I think it really, um, uh, rings true because it made me change some of the strategies that we're doing at work. So there's a system change organization, lower um, bottom part of the North Island, and they were working in a predominantly Maori area to build capacity to get young people into the health sector because it was all Pakehas serving the community. And they they spent three years, they built the track. The, the capacity help them with the interviews and not one of these young Maori uh, people got in on an entry level. So they thought, okay, what's gone wrong then? So they then pivoted and started working with that health organization and said, okay, really looking at what's been discussed in this um, chat, looking at your processes and your mind shifts and, um, and stuff started to have aha moments about the way that you recruit, et cetera. And I've also seen it in some of our pilot programs on the employment internship, which um, if you plug into the ethnic communities this Friday at six o'clock, you can find more about. But going back to my question is, what do you think those levers of change to bring those um, Pakeha, predominantly Pakeha organizations on board. Thanks, Rakana. A great question. And I, this is open to the panel. So whoever feels ready to answer that big question, please just um, go for it. I might just jump in then because I don't like awkward silences. But um, <laughs> um, and also, I didn't realize I wasn't meant to be answering all these questions on the chat. So sorry. <laughs> but um, I think you're absolutely right, Rakana, but I think that's exactly what this conversation is about, right? Like Sport Waitakere um, noticed that there's probably more work that be could be done in this sector across the board and has brought people together from other sporting, I'm not a very sporty person, so sporting groups, I'm going to say. Um, but there's also a little bit of nothing about us without us as well, right? So they've got many of us here who have lived through some of the barriers that they have picked up through the research report as well. So I actually see this as a really good forum to speak to people who may not have been thinking about or might not have known what changes to take to get there. We've all got to start somewhere. So I think this is a really good start and other sectors should be looking at doing something like this. But you're right, equally through the Employment Action Plan, for example, we're looking at spaces in which we can start having these conversations to bring about some change. So it needs to be a bit of both. It needs to be people who've walked this being part of it as well, but it also needs to be in spaces where people don't quite see what the challenges are, but are willing to change. Thank you, Minister. And I hope that's answered your question, um, Rakana. So I will move on to the next one. Um, and I'll read the question. So. 
Minister Radhakrishnan and other research has found that shoulder tapping communities to boards do elicit um, positive responses. How would you encourage our boards to do so rather than the hand up model that the AGM process relies upon? Um, not like, how, Richard, how do you feel about that question? Yeah, um, I think shoulder tapping is, is okay. okay. Obviously, you still need to have those skills that the board requires um, and that they're looking for. Um, that's, yeah, that, that's pretty, pretty much if you've got the skills and, and you do get shoulder tapped, it's, it's unfortunately in New Zealand, it, it is a bit of who you know um not what you know sometimes and so shoulder tapping is is sometimes um done but saying that you know the ethnic uh, the ministry of ethnic communities have a great um database where um public service can look for ethnic community um directors or ethnic directors Thanks, Richard. So it's a bit of both. There is a database and there is some shoulder tapping involved if you have the right skills, of course. Um, and moving on, I think this will be a question for you, Rakesh, talking about your passion for sports quite clearly. Was um, So Paula from NZ Football mentions that can um, provide learning opportunities to gain governance experience. So what are the steps that we need to take to encourage to make this happen more? Um, thanks, Paula. <laughs> I think the, uh, the, the the main thing is is organisations, uh, in uh, national sporting organisations, clubs, uh, sports for um, and in a sport sense, but then also in an organisational sense to really create those programs for interns. Um, Paula mentioned it uh, in the thread, and as has others. I mean, that's one uh, relatively straightforward formal process that you can put in place. I mean, the minister right now has a program that she has highlighted in the public service for the ethnic graduates. And that is uh, a, a program where ethnic graduates are going to government agencies and getting the opportunity to see how government agencies function. And in this way, agencies themselves are increasing their uh, knowledge and being enriched by graduates coming uh, coming in that they would not normally have had the opportunity to do through a, a, a formal recruitment process or a job application process for whatever reason, uh, barriers, discrimination, uh, opportunity. So, you know, I believe that uh, if organizations are wanting to really value this, they can create an opportunity for internships and for, for mentoring at the very least. Mm -hmm. And that could be, or even, you know, for boards, you have observation, uh, board observer, you can invite somebody to come and be an observer. Uh, you can have, uh, well, you know, while a board may have a set number of uh, executive members that must be on the board per their constitution, etc. You can always have observers or you can have uh, people that can come in uh, that's not part of the formal process, but to increase their skills. And that's, uh, that's always an option. So I think it's, it's about communicating that into the system, broadening that and, and just seeing where the opportunities lie. Uh, so Kesha, I saw quite a few nodding heads as you were sharing them then, <laughs> so uh, as I was too. Um, and I've seen there's lots of, been lots of great commentary there in the chat as well. And our panelists have been jumping in and answering those. So big, big thanks. Um, and this question I'm going to pose to you, Susan. So building on Alvin's comment, um, when do we get the opportunity to be in governance and formal leadership roles? What are some tips or ideas to support organizations to begin? Or continue their um, diversity and inclusion journeys. Um, so I just want to clarify. You mean um, from the a board's perspective, or for the candidates' perspective? This is from the can. It seems like it's from the candidates' perspective. So when do we get the opportunity to be in governance and formal leadership roles? Okay. If you're a, yeah. yeah. Um, I think um, it's. Uh, um, it's a two-way um, exercise. I think one is to 
um, promoted the, uh, the value of diverse voices uh, of the public boards and uh, the private boards and, and um, to, to get them to see the contribution um, the diverse community um, the members can bring to the boards. Um, I, um, the minister and, and the previous um, speakers already said the public boards has the obligation and, and aim to increase the percentage of um, diverse members um, taking part of the um, public boards. And for the um, private boards, um, as far as I understand, uh, in New Zealand, um, um, for, for commercial purposes, uh, many, many private boards now see the value what the um, ethnic members bring in um, from their connections um, their um, um, knowledge and experience, and um, particularly in overseas in the overseas market, and also helping them to open um, up the specific market um, in within New Zealand as well. Um, I see more and more private boards opening up um, their um, minds to recruit um, and sometimes shoulder tap into um, particular members from um, the ethnic background. Um, for, uh, secondly, for our candidates, uh, I think the candidates um, need um, some um, encouragement um, and also um, some experience and, and mentoring program to them, let them know what um, the roles are, what expectations, expectations are, um, and how the boards work, um, what the practical, um, um, sorry, the procedures are. Uh, what is required in terms of time, skills, and contribution from them. Um, we have already mentioned previously, mentoring is quite good um, uh, way of doing it. Um, and I really particularly like uh, Rakesh just uh, mentioned about observers, opening up opportunities for people to observe, to see what's um, happening uh, around the board tables. Um, and also um, uh, the, um, the, the basic um, governance training, what Spot Watakri is running, it will be very helpful as well. I uh, hope that um, answers the question. That's great. Thank you, Susan. Um, it's good to hear some, some movement is being made on the, the private sector boards because we often hear about actually that's where a lot more work needs to be done. Um, while we're making some um, improvements in the public sector, it does need to be um, sector wide. So thank you for sharing your insights then. Um, uh, we've got, we do, I think we still have time, hey, Javed, for a couple more questions that I can see on here. Um, and I want to invite Katie Bruffy to ask her question. So if you just turn on your, your mic and your camera, please. Okay. Kia ora ko Katie Bruffy Tokoingwa. Thank you, um, firstly, to the panel. What an amazing conversation and really appreciate your time. I've asked a little bit of a cheeky question from... Um, a board member's perspective. We're doing a bit of work um, as a board around our impact um, as an organization. And it would be really fantastic to hear from the panel um, what you think um, is the most important thing for us to consider, for us as for Watakari to consider um, to positively impact our ethnic communities, not just today, but you know, 20 years from now. Great question, Katie. And this one's op it's open to the panel. So whoever wants to jump in, please do. Rakesh, I see your, your, your mic is unmuted. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm busy looking at all that thread. So just to, to um, I guess contextualize the question is about what is it that we would do that have the long term impact? Is that what I heard? Yeah, correct. What can we do for long term impact, you know, for ethnic communities from an organizational perspective? I think, um, Kitty, is you know, the discussion here tonight and what I've seen in the thread is, is matching up people's skills uh, with opportunity. And I think that uh, for organizations, they need to carefully consider the current makeup of their board and their skills matrix and take a uh, look at their strategic plan and where they want to head to. And what are this, what is their stakeholder and insights telling them? 
and then to purposefully then match that with good with good people. There's more than uh, enough good people that are out there that want to be on boards. As we can see from our uh, this uh, chat thread, it's just about the skill sets that's able to do that. So I think uh, we, we normally spend a lot of time from as organizations strategically looking at the business, but we don't really strategically look at our government. It really just comes around and then we say, all right, who are we gonna put the search committee out there? Uh, let us see who's, uh, uh, you know, what is the criteria that we require? Maybe do the skills matrix that we, we put out. But, you know, we need to be very purposeful to say, if we want to be a treaty-based organization, we need to go out there and find the best candidate as possible. And we need to go and, and, and make an effort from, a, from an organization perspective. Um, if we want to find uh, diversity or somebody that's going to give us insight from the rainbow community or a disability perspective based on our strategic intent, um, we can then bring that all together. I, I just, uh, from what I've noticed is things, uh, sometimes the board roles are not communicated well to the membership when the members vote and, and have uh, ownership of uh, appointing people to the board. We need to be very purposeful of engaging with that membership uh, well in advance to really bring them on board as to why we require uh, certain skills. And then it doesn't get into the conversation of, oh, you're just trying to appoint people based on ethnicity, or you're just trying to uh, appoint people based on uh, criteria um, and they think, you know, out of an equity lens. So, so that's really, I would see a long-term vision is really have a governance strategy as well. Thanks so much, Rakesh. Katie, I hope that's answered your question fully for you. I think just looking at time, we do actually have two more questions. Um, and I'd like to invite Shay Singh to um, turn on your mic and your camera if you're here. Shay Singh. Hi there. Hi, Shay. Hi. Go, go. I had a couple of questions. I'll, I'll go with the last one that I asked, which was about um, panelists' experience about the imposter syndrome, or there were some comments about um, having the experiences not being understood or advocating for a different point of view. Uh, and the point I was making is that is it more about let's just have somebody who fits the diversity or takes the diversity tick in the room, so long as they, you know, follow the rules and the guidelines and go with the status quo versus creating the space for the person to bring about their diverse thinking? Um, yes, yeah, Shay, uh, Rakesh here, yeah, I'll just throw my few cents out there. Um, I mean, whenever you go into any work group or any team or even family situation or whatever it is, it's really the culture of that space that you walk into. And I'd say that, um, when you walk into an environment, if you're quite attuned to it, you'll know yourself, you'll get a quick sense of reading the room as to whether you're being appreciated or whether you're being valued or whether you're just there <laughs> to make up the numbers. And I think it is really about understanding the environment and that culture you're heading into and being very open and forthright from the very beginning, as in the sense that I'm here because I'm here to make a contribution. I am feeling like this. It doesn't mean that you, you um, have to hide that. I mean, we all enter into some type of uh, sense of uncomfort and, and growth and we need to challenge, uh, challenge ourselves. And we need to be in a safe space in order to do that as well. That's right. So, yeah. so it's a bit of both. So sometimes you can head into a place where the organization is very hostile environment in a board setting. And really you've been selected because they, they require some change, but they don't know how to do it. So you're gonna to have to navigate firstly, your own feelings of being in that space. That's not going to be comfortable. And that's where we're gonna be thinking, how can I positively influence this? So the next person that comes into the space actually has a different experience than what I'm having right now. It's gonna be much safer for them. And you, you, you gotta positively try to impact that. And, and, and that's where it comes on to more of the technical aspects of how to change culture, how to put forward suggestions, how to uh, walk them through that process. 
I mean, most organizations I found are very willing to engage. The problem that they don't have is access into, our, into ethnic communities or know who to, to reach out to, to guide them. And they're really looking for allies and supporters because they're feeling that, yep, we've been so far behind the eight ball. Now we need to get ahead of this. How can we have the right person come in and uh, into this environment? So, yeah, I will, I, hopefully I'm not talking in circles, but uh, simply to say that it, it, is, um, it, it is not an easy thing, but uh, I guess that's where the governance uh, commitment that you are making to is going to come into it. I'm just going to jump in there if that's all right, real, real quick to say, totally agree with what Rakesh was saying. And it also then becomes a bit of a self fulfilling prophecy. So because we're all products of our society, right? So when you are then the lone voice in a space, and you're feeling that, um, you know, you're the only one maybe talking about the importance of engaging with ethnic communities, you kind of then internalize that after a point. So that's where I think the imposter syndrome comes into be as well, because you're often the only one there. And so then you start internalizing the lack of visibility that you've experienced in so many other places. And then it keeps, that becomes a bit of a, a bit of a cycle that those of us who are then, all of us in positions where we can change that, need to change that as Rakesh was saying so that others don't experience the same thing. And what I was actually gonna say was, I'm just gonna chuck on the, on the chat screen, a really good article that was written by Jahan Kasinada on this, on stuff. Um, it's called, do we really want diversity if we expect ethnic Kiwis to lose their culture? And it's about being able to bring your whole self to various aspects, whether it's work or leadership and how certain people, when you're often, when you're the first in something, you've known that you can't bring your whole self but you swallow that bitter pill because then you can make a change for others. And I'm just going to chuck a link to that article uh, in the chat for anyone who wants to read it. Thanks so much, Minister Shay. We hope you've, that answer has been uh, that question. Um, Thank you. Difficult question, but much needed um, discussion has helped um, in some way. So thank you, Shay, very much. And I think just looking at time now, we could we actually, let's, I think it's time to wrap this up, Kay Javid. Um, <laughs> so I just, want to say a huge thank you to our um, wonderful panelists tonight, to the minister, to Rakesh, to Richard, to Susan. Um, you've shared very openly and very honestly, um, and I've um, taken away some very rich insights um, myself, and I'm sure our uh, guests have too. Um, I thank you for, um, you know, going into spaces of um, vulnerability um, and sharing um, in, a, in a very safe um, and um, comprehensive way. So thank you so much. And back over to Javed. Thank you so much to the panel and thank you so much to everyone that's kind of, um, that asked questions and, and added to it. It's been awesome. And, you know, the questions have been amazing. Um, you know, I really want to, to say a big thank you to our, um, you know, to our panelists to say, you know, thank you for for all all the wisdom that you've brought, all the insights that you've shared, and we really hope that we can, as together as we move forward, we start to create change in a system that's, you know, sometimes you know not ready for change. But I mean, there are some cool things that were talked about, and I think I just really want to touch on a couple of things and. You know, talking about the language and, and stuff like that that goes on in governance roles. You know, one of the one of the key quotes that sticks with me in terms of the um, the research that myself and Jason and myself did, there was a, a guy who born in New Zealand and he says, "What does governance even mean?" And you know, we've got this as someone that's born in New Zealand, an Indian man who's been born in New Zealand. But so, you know, we asked that question of our migrant communities and all of a sudden they have no idea. And, you know, I was having a reflection the other day about school camps and the experiences that I had in my first ever camp. And, you know, I didn't even know what chores were because we didn't use that word in my home. And so, you know, all these words and languages and things that we do are so, you know, we have so much to, to support our communities to be able to do that. Um, and the other point that I really wanted to kind of really um, jump in on was getting on the boat to rock it let's get on the boat you know if we have an opportunity to get on a roll like this let's jump on and rock the boat from the inside because it's more likely to to create change than we are from standing from the outside so 
once again, thank you so much to Nigeria for the great facilitation of the panel, to the panelists for all your insights and everyone for your questions. I think this has been an awesome opportunity and I'm going to love watching this back and cutting it all up for YouTube a little bit later. Or maybe I'll ask Grace to cut it up for YouTube. But um, so I, I'm going to really, we're going to jump into a little bit of um, the last little bits for this um, webinar is what's next for our, what's next for this piece of work. And it's, um, thanks to the, the funding from the Ministry of Ethnic Communities, Sport Lake Taki would like to launch the first ever governance training program for our ethnic communities um, to develop the confidence and competence, which has been actually talked about a lot today in our panel, um, of our ethnic communities to participate in broader committee roles within community sport organisations. Um, if you're interested in participating in this four-week program delivered by our friends at LEAD, um, either scan the QR code that's on the screen now. I think we all have been using QR codes a bit and we're all into it. So I'm sure you guys will find the right app to do it. Um, and then follow or um, click the link is going to go and jump in the chat. So jump in there, fill out the expression of interest form and we will be, um, we'll connect with you to make sure this kind of, this goes forward. Um, you can have a look there on the screen. There's some really cool kind of um, things that we're going to talk about. And so we're really keen to kind of have that happen. Before we finish tonight, we also want to get your thoughts and we want to get the thoughts of, of everyone that's in this room. Um, so I've got really two kind of high level questions that I'd love everyone to ask in the chat, um, answer in the chat, sorry. Um, so the first one is after listening to tonight's conversations, what is one thing you or organize, your organization would like to do differently um, as it relates to governance and um, ethnic diversity? But also we've started a conversation here we've started something so we want to continue this movement and how do we continue this who wants to be part of it what do you want to see of it and how can sport waitakere and our partners all work together to be able to continue this this mahi that we're doing so i'm going to give everyone a couple of minutes um to fill that out and then once once that's all done then i will um wrap us up and we will be um then we'll you know we'll have a bit of time to, to hopefully get dinner sorted <laughs> if we haven't done so already. Some really awesome comments coming through so just keep continue to to keep chucking those in keep this conversation going what can we do all together to start to do this and and really make a difference and you know whilst we're set in the sports sector we can start this to create change more widely um and you know we're really excited here at sport white Arcady to be able to to start this and get these wheels going and i've um made reference to jason a number of times but jason's still on the call and i just like to you know put my appreciation out to him for doing all this work and really kind of working together to be able to kind of get this where we, where we really want to. So continue to do this, um, continue to put some stuff in the chat, um, you know, and continue to start thinking about it. And I think, you know, even um, we'll, you know, we'll go from there and, you know, even if you, if it's not coming to mind now and you go to bed tonight and you think about it, um, do reach out to us at Sport Waitakere and we'll, you know, we'll put my email address in the, in the chat there for people as well that want to want to do that. Um, so we've got a really cool um, quote from Raylene Castle, actually, um, the CEO of Sport New Zealand that I thought was really apt as well. And I think, you know, the really the last part for me was what kind of hit home was, you know, it's about how you give people an opportunity to talk openly, honestly, about their individual views, but in a way that respects the views of everyone. And you know, how can we can, um, you know, how we can continue these conversations and make sure we can we can continue to do this. So, um, 
just before I close, I would like, if Jason, you are still on the call, um, to maybe have a couple of words if you want to um, share any words or through your experience as well. Um, hi, thank you. Thank you for the amazing night. Even I know that with the sport I tell you, but I, I, my heart will, will always be. So, so yes, as a migrant, to be honest, I really wanted to uh, try my best to help my um, my people, but people with the same background, same experience to get through this kind of a dilemma. Because as migrant, you know, when you get to a new space, new environment, it's, everything's become so hard. Even, even just like a talking to people, make the orders of, of, of when you get to the restaurant, everything, every easy stuff becomes so hard. So especially, so not to mention about, uh, you know, the, um, the social stuff and the, and the things like that. So and the, during the interview, um, I got a, so um, the stories I shared was is so, so a lot of compelling and, uh, and some really, really, really uh, impressive stories. And, uh, and, uh, and, and I come up with that, um, yeah, because I am kind of getting through that. And the, the reason why I'm just doing, uh, put a lot of passion to this report is that I wanna help others to get through this. And especially for some people with the same experience, some, some people living um, um, have experienced um, discriminations and, uh, and some people have their experience the racism. So how, how they deal with this? Actually, a lot of them, they just suffer. Sometimes they just silence because they don't know what to do and how to deal with it. So they need support. And some people with high profile in the, in the back country but they cannot do much in, in the New Zealand. So what was the problem? So, and, and I know I always say that it's not that we don't have a, it's not that we really don't have a leadership and a governance skills. Sometimes we just need a trigger to activate it because there are people from the, uh, some of the migrants, they are high profile. They're coming from a leadership role, but it's not in New Zealand. It's not, so it doesn't make sense if the environment change and they doesn't mean their skill is not there. So what we need to do, I think is provide a, provide a safety or friendly environment for them to upscale, to show off. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why, why behind, behind that I do this report. And, and I just really wanted to provide more support to those people with skills, you know, to, to be shining again and to be what they used to be. And that's the point. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And you know, your passion for this work actually came through a lot. So um, I just want to circle back to one comment about um, getting on the boat to rocket. Um, I can't claim, you can't, you might have to um, credit my undergrad lecturer, my coaching lecturer, Andrew, Andrew Hewitson, that um, Katie, Katie knows quite well. He, he was the one that taught me about that when we were talking about sport coaching. And so that's kind of been my mantra as, I, as I've worked through the system. So maybe a cited from or something like that, um, minister will go fine. So um, I'd just like to close with a karakia um, and we will stop the, we'll stop the recording and we can continue the conversations in the chat if people